and, and, and so, yeah, this idea that you are going to receive the Holy Spirit. I mean, we sometimes imagine that if we had been with Jesus, we wouldn't have been like these dumb fishermen, you know, <laughs> especially if we had been prepped, you know. But the fact is we would make, I think, we would fail just as much as they did, only differently. Yes. And so I just want to say we need the Holy Spirit. And it wasn't like, well, after Pentecost, they didn't have that need any longer. Right. You need the Holy Spirit like you need oxygen, yeah. just to breathe supernatural life. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is not something that goes away. Yeah. And I also wanted to emphasize the fact that in the first reading, we have something similar to what we find at the end of Luke's gospel. And that is, in Luke 24, he raises his hands as he ascends into heaven. That detail is kind of assumed here in Acts 1, but that is a priestly blessing. Mm -hmm. And it's also a royal enthronement. So if the ascension takes him up to heaven, where the God-man mounts the throne that God had occupied before the incarnation, it really is, as you indicate, it's royal and priestly. Indeed. At the right hand is echoing Psalm 110. You know, there, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So you're not just a king, you are a priest king. And so this is where everything that the king did in terms of justice, everything that the priest did in terms of holiness and sacrifice, all of that was but a prelude to what Christ is going to be doing forever and ever. Yes, yeah, and that royal priesthood of, of Christ is, runs through all of Paul's epistles, and you see it in Ephesians. Yeah, you sure do. And um, this, this, uh, uh, this priestly kingship of Christ, where he's raised from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavens, um, and the implications of this are, are so profound. You know, Paul himself has to pray for the Ephesians to have, as, as you were mentioning, you know, just as the apostles needed the grace of the Holy Spirit to comprehend wow. the nature of the kingdom, so did these later Ephesians believers. So do we to this day. Right. To May the us. eyes of your hearts be enlightened. Right. Who doesn't need that to be renewed continuously? Indeed. So it, it takes the eyes of faith to walk into Mass, for example, and see that this really is the kingdom of God that we're sharing a meal and we're celebrating the ascension and enthronement of the son of David. Uh, and, and so mass in a very real sense is kind of a, a, an experience once again of what the apostles were encountering with Christ at his ascension in this first reading. But it takes the eyes of faith to see that. And, uh, and furthermore, um, to understand that, uh, that we, we share in this power you know, the, the catechism teaches, the, the, the scriptures themselves teach us that we're baptized into Christ's offices. So if we emphasize Christ as being king and priest, we share in those offices via our baptism. The Holy Spirit in, indwells us and creates us as priest in image of Christ the priest, kings in image. And, and those are positions of authority. Um, but we tend not to think of that as lay Catholics. You know, we have to make, of course, important distinctions between the royal priesthood of the laity and the ministerial priesthood of those in holy orders. And, and we can assume all those proper distinctions. But in our life as lay Catholics, there is a certain authority about it. Um, a saint that both of us uh, are very familiar with and, and much beloved, St. Josemaria Escrivá, used to s say that we as Christians should have a superiority complex. Right. Because we not in ourselves, but in Christ. No, in Christ. Yeah, yeah, not in our flesh, not anything about right. ourselves, but because Christ indwells us through the Holy Spirit. And this should give us a, a kind of a bounce in our step and a certain kind of authority about the way that we approach life. Yeah, you know, St. Josemaria is capturing what St. Paul is really saying. Right. To be in Christ, I think we tend to reduce that to being we're in the know yeah. or we're in the mood. <laughs> no, you are in Christ like we are in Steubenville, like we are in the studio. And so if we are in Christ and Christ is in heaven, we're not reducible to where we happen to be in terms of a terrestrial location. There really is a sense in which the humanity of Christ has been divinized so that it's not just located in a geospatial way up there through the spirit through baptism, through especially the Holy Eucharist, whereby we receive the glorified body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. We are in Christ. We are seated with him in the heavenly places in a way that is not just metaphorical or futuristic. You know, our guardian angels are saying, you know, it's much more than being in the mood or being in the know. It's even more than being in the chair. 
We are in Christ in a way that our words can express, but our brains can't fully grasp. We just have to believe that. And you know, you also pointed out the principality, authority, and power and dominion, both the good guys and the bad guys, both the holy angels and the fallen angels. That's what Paul's describing. And the sorcerers and the magicians in antiquity, and even still today, know that by conjuring up, by evoke, invoking certain names of certain spirits, you can bring the kingdom of darkness from below to here and now. But far more, we have the name that is above every name, so that the, the, the most powerful and dangerous and deceptive demons are completely subject to the name of Jesus Indeed. in a way that, once again, our brains can barely grasp. But we don't need to understand something to live it out. Right. You know? yeah. Like children, we are growing up and discovering that obedience is what really leads to understanding. 